Hello, everybody. It's Reed Tracy. Welcome back to our business and writing newsletter. And today's guest is Sean Nix Jones, and she has a business called Chuckling Goat, which is, is my all time favorite <laughs> business name. <laughs> And Sean is actually located in Wales, even though you'll hear her accent. She has an American accent, but she lives in Wales. And her business, Chuckling Goat, is in Wales. She lives on a farm in Ra Wales. She's written a couple different books for Hay House, but her latest book is <laughs> How to Start Your Business on Your Kitchen Table. And I love that title. It's so great. And and it's really kind of what you did, huh, Sean? You you started your business on a kitchen table after kind of helping your family getting over a health issue. So I'd love for you just to start out by telling how you got started with Chuckling Goat. Sure. Well, it was never about the cash, I can tell you that. And I can tell you what I didn't have. I didn't have any business experience. I didn't have deep pockets. I never thought that I could run a business or should run a business. For me, it was really just about trying to help my family when they were ill. So it started out when my little boy, Benji, had eczema, and then he got a horrible bronchial infection. He kept going into the doctors over and over, taking more and more antibiotics. He was just getting worse and worse. And I said to my husband, who is a Welsh goat farmer, what are we going to do? We got to do something. He's too little to be taking all these bad chemicals. I didn't know much at that time, but I knew that I could feel it in my bones. That was not good. And my husband said, let's get a goat. I said, Why? I just told you my son was sick and you're telling me get a goat. I don't understand that. But what I knew was that my husband is almost always right. It's really annoying, but he always knows this stuff. What he knew in the Welsh farming tradition is that goat's milk is very good for bron bronchial conditions and asthma and eczema. So, okay, we got a goat. We started milking the goat. I gave Benji the goat milk and that was good. But then I had too much milk and it was stacking up in my fridge and it was going off and I didn't know what to do with all this milk I had. So I went online. And I typed in, what do I do with too much goat's milk? Um, and what I came up with was this stuff called kefir, which I'd never heard of before, um, but it was being used by a Russian doctor. Um, so I got in touch with her, said, hey, how do I make it in a good, pure way to make it really strong? She told me, and we started making it. Um, it was not a big uh, going proposition at the time because nobody had ever heard of it at that time and it was unsweetened. So it tasted really tart and tangy. So we would drive around in our car with these little pints, you know, of kefir and say, hey, here's this stuff. You never heard of it and it doesn't taste very good, huh? And they go, oh, no, <laughs> actually not. <laughs> so it was a very small acorn that our oak tree grew from. Yeah, and and then and then you you started. Didn't your husband get sick too? And you had to help him. And can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah. So my husband went into the hospital for an operation. He had colitis. They removed his entire large intestine. So he came back with MRSA, which is a superbug infection. It was eating little holes in his abdominal incision. So instead of healing every day, these little holes were getting you know longer and deeper um the doctor came out and had a look at his wound and said i have no experience with anything of this magnitude and he actually left the house got in the car locked the doors i watched him do that and and drove off the um up the track and he just left us there and i thought well so my husband has mrsa which is contagious and they won't let you in the hospital. They won't let him into hospice. So what happens? Does he just die on my sofa? Is that what we're talking about? And I hadn't met him until I was 41. You know, I'm really proof that life begins at 40. <laughs> and I thought, boy, this is not how my happy ending finishes. This man does not die on my sofa on my watch. So I was trying to figure out what I could do to change the frame. Because here's the thing, Reed. I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, but I am a communications girl. And I know a frame when I see one. I was looking at all the medical stuff that I was reading and it was all talking about war. We're gonna kill the bacteria, we're gonna fight the bacteria, the bacteria is gonna fight back. And I thought, you know what? That's the wrong question. How can you kill the bacteria 
I'm not going to win that and my husband's going to die. I need to ask a different question. So what I asked was, right, how can I bring all of that into harmony? I need an ally on the microbiotic level. And that question I had an answer to. The kefir that we were making in our stone barn puts good bacteria in the microbiotic level and that suppresses the bad bacteria. It doesn't kill them, just puts them back into their ecosystem box. So I coated my husband with our kefir and he smelled like a cheese, okay? It was not a, it was not a friendly process. But in two weeks, his MRSA cleared and his wound healed and he got up out of bed and got on his tractor and he's been there ever since. So that was my own private miracle. Um, we saved my husband's life. And after that, the Welsh Assembly government sent some people over to say, you know, what's going on over here? We're hearing funny stories. They took all of our remedies and they tested them at Aberystwyth University and found, yep, okay, it's real. Uh, this, all this works. I'd use some essential oils to help knock the pathogens back. They tested that. It was effective. They tested the kefir and they said, okay, this is for real. Um, and then it got into the newspaper and then we started getting some attention around our business. So that was a time when a crisis became an opportunity. And I write about that a lot in the book. The very worst things that happen to you can be the very most powerful crucibles that can turn your business around. Yeah, I mean, you definitely, I mean, how to write your book on the kitchen table, or not write your book, <laughs> how to start your business on the kitchen table, even though you probably wrote the book there too. It's really true for you. Like you were in this farm and you found out this key for work and that it helped different people with different things. And the start, it kind of just started by you wanting to help other people. And then, and then it kind of spread by word of mouth. Is that kind of how things got started? Well, that's exactly how it started. And you're right. I did write the book on the kitchen table. <laughs> um, we got the, the, so I started making soaps and lotions because I thought, well, if other people are going to use this, they're not going to want to just put this stuff all over their body. It's going to have to smell good. It's going to have to feel good. They don't want to smell like a cheese. So I went to soap school and I learned to make uh, soaps and lotions and put the kefir in it. And that was a good turning point. And then Fortnum and Mason um, went, picked up our soaps and lotions and they wanted to sell them. So that was exciting. And I thought, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll write, because here we are on the farm. I've got the view, I've got the goats. I didn't have business experience, but I did have the goats. And I thought I'll do a little um, diary of life on the farm and that can sit next to the soaps in Fortnum and Mason and the you know people who shop there might like to see the pictures of the goats so I sat down at my kitchen table and I wrote up a book um, that's such a good thing to do I know you really uh, support the idea of people writing their stories but that was the best thing I ever did because then you found that book and picked it up and Hay House republished it so that was a huge turning point for us. Um, you know, you gave us some investment and we actually were able to take it the next step. And once we had that little bump and that little support, um, then things started to really get busy. Because what we found out was if you take the kefir and drink it and put it on your skin, it works amazingly for things like eczema, which my son had. So we started to get really powerful results. Um, but I was never interested in cash. You know, we never said cash was king. We always wanted to keep it small, keep it on the farm, and help people. We're trying to give, you know, create natural healing remedies for problems that the doctors can't fix. See, that's what that's what I love. I love to. That's what gets me up early and makes me stay up late um, to try to get those natural healing solutions. And so, that's what I was trying to explain to people in the book is. You may think that you have to have it all together before you start your business. And people may go, well, I can't run a business. I don't know enough about math. You know what? I can't even balance my checkbook. I never could and I still can't. I don't know how to do a business plan. Neither do I. I never, never wrote a business plan. Turns out you don't need one. What you do need is a passion to give your gift to the world. And I really believe, Reed, that every person has a gift that is unique to them. And if they don't give that gift, it will remain forever ungiven. So a business is just a way to walk your gift into the world and give it, just like you would bake somebody a birthday cake and go, here, I made this for you. That's what it's about. You don't have to know everything before you start. I certainly didn't. You learn as you go. And that's the beauty of the process. 
you may think that you have to have it all together before you start your business. And people may go, well, I can't run a business. I don't know enough about math. You know what? I can't even balance my checkbook. I never could and I still can't. I don't know how to do a business plan. Neither do I. I never, never wrote a business plan. Turns out you don't need one. What you do need is a passion to give your gift to the world. And I really believe, Reed, that every person has a gift that is unique to them. And if they don't give that gift, it will remain forever ungiven. So a business is just a way to walk your gift into the world and give it just like you would bake somebody a birthday cake and go, here, I made this for you. That's what it's about. You don't have to know everything before you start. I certainly didn't. You learn as you go. And that's the beauty of the process. Yeah. So you submitted your book to Hay House UK. And then when I saw it, like they were talking to me about the book and, and I said, well, you know, I like the book's good. And, but Sean sounds amazing. We'd love to talk to her and, and, and we're real interested in the business because it was so unique and different and something completely different. I remember we met at like a little pub in London <laughs> and <laughs> We talked about everything and Hay House made an, Hay House in the UK, we made an investment in, um, in Chuckling Goat to help her, help Sean like expand it and, and get into more places and get more people to know about how much this could help other people. Um, and like, and like Sean says, really what she does is everything she creates at Chuckling Goat has a reason to help somebody. And then as, as things started going, people started realizing that, um, you know, it helped more and more helps with your digestion. It's like probiotic kind of ideas. Um, what are some of the things that can be helped by, like you were on a farm in in Wales and you just and you got this goat and now I mean one of the cool things about um chuckling goat is Sean like is passionate just as passionate about taking care of the goats as she is <laughs> creating the, the goat milk like she had, they're all named and they're friends of the family and she recruits people around her and other farms to make the goat milk because they didn't have enough goats so like Tell us some of the, the creative ideas and thoughts and things you did to really get this all started. Well, you're right. All of our goats have names and not numbers. They are definitely characters and personalities. And you know, what we believe is that everything matters, that you create a little value crystal. And if it's right at the heart of it, if your values and your passions are right and true, then it will be right as it grows. It's like having a little crystal and then growing in an ice palace. If you, this is what I learned from working with the gut microbiome, it's an ecosystem. And if you starve one part of the ecosystem to feed another part, that's not gonna work. So businesses that harm the planet in order to help other people and make money, that's not gonna do it. These days, it is too late, I believe, for us to do anything except start businesses that are good from the ground up. And for me, that means good for the microbes, good for the soil, good for the plants, good for the animals, good for the people, good for the customers, good for the world. It needs to be good for the world. And so that's the idea of a value-centered business. I'm not suggesting that people go out and create you know, doohickeys made from horrible stuff that the world doesn't need because the world's got enough of those. Yeah. Do something that is the combination of what you love, what you're good at, what you can get paid for, what the world needs, and the direction that the universe is pushing you. Because my experience is, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a newspaper journalist. I'm a radio talk show host. I'm not a doctor or scientist. I had no experience with anything, including goats. My husband had to teach me everything, and I had no idea what I was doing. But the universe was just pushing me along all the way. And I tell you, Reed, these days, instead of setting targets, I try to surrender. And the more I surrender, the more the universe pushes me into amazing places that I would never have been able to think in my tiny brain. So I just try to get out of the way these days. I just really try to surrender to the direction the universe is taking me and say, okay, you know, clearly this universe has a bigger plan than I could ever conceive. 
Yeah. And so your business, like any other business, has had ups and downs, like it all took off and then there were some struggles. So what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned um, from starting and running this business that you can share with others um, to help them along this path? Because people are on all different places on their business. Some are just thinking of starting it. Some are starting it, but struggling. Some are booming and um, having things going great. So what, what are some of the big lessons you learn? I know you share a lot of them in the book to really take people step by step from starting, going through, but so what are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way? I think the most important lesson for me is never compromise, never cut corners. Don't do it. You don't have to compromise what's important to you. You need to figure out what your values are. And I have um, a whole meditation in the book about how to figure out what your values are. It's not that easy. You say, oh, I have good values. Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I just want to be happy. You need to know exactly what your values are. Because if you don't have your own agenda, somebody is going to have an agenda for you. So you've, you need to get in touch with that little voice inside your heart and i for me i lay my hands right here over my heart and say okay i try to drop my attention from my head down to here and listen and go okay what am i supposed to do next that's if you're running your own business you got to take direction from your heart because that's the only place nobody else is telling you what to do um the other thing i found really powerful was in any crisis and boy we have crises i tell you what they happen all the time <laughs> especially working with animals you know it happens but there's things that happen um i'll just give you one example we were uh, i i'm really i love the science even though i'm not a scientist i think it's really exciting this microbiome test came out on the market great i said oh i want that for my customers they're going to really love it and i'm quite customer driven i try to stay in close touch with my customers they're going to love this but I thought that's too much data. It was 80 pages of, you know, PDF. Nobody's got time for that. And, you know, everybody's busy. What am I going to do? I'll, I'll get a nutritionist who can explain your results to you. Great. I hired somebody um, and then we launched the, the test. We sold 400 in one week. It was just people were going mad for it. Great. This guy quit on me. He quit. <laughs> he sent me an email and said, I can't deal with this. And I thought, well, that's great because I've got 400 people who are waiting to talk to you, sir. And I'm in a remote part of the world. There's not a lot of people around here that do that. So I thought, what am I going to do? And my website designer, who's really smart, said, look, how is this an opportunity? This is the question we always ask each other. And in my opinion, it's the one question you ask anytime anything goes wrong. How is this an opportunity? And I went, I don't know. <laughs> and then I was like, well, if it was an opportunity, how would it be an opportunity? We said, okay, well, we do everything better in-house anyway. What if, we, what if we train the people who are here to be nutritionists? And do you know that's what we did? We offered that opportunity to everybody, the people who milk the goats, the people who pack the boxes. I said, who wants to be a nutritionist? I will train you. And one person would work while the other person studied and then they would switch. And by the time those tests came out, I had six trained nutritionists on my staff. And of course that's totally changed the nature of the business. Um, everyone who answers my phone is now a nutritional advisor, but I would never have thought that up myself. It was the opportunity that came out of the crisis. And see, to me, that's the beauty of actually putting your boots on the road, not waiting till everything's perfect, not waiting till you have a lot of money. Uh, we didn't have money. My husband had to sell his motorcycle so we could buy bottles to put the kefir in. <laughs> I mean, that's, we were broke, I tell you. We were flat broke. This is before you invested, mind. Yeah. Um, but we had, to, we had to pull everything together. If you just jump off the cliff and try it, you will figure it out as you go and the process itself will be your teacher and the bad things that happen to you will have seeds of opportunity inside them. So there's a wonderful statistic, 98% of people who start their own business succeed or fail report that they loved it and they would do it again because it's about how much you learn and how much you experience. And the secret for me, Reed, is really business is just a medium for self-development. 
it really it's just one more way that you can actually put your stuff together um, and it's a it's it, and speed up the process of working on your own personal development that's what it has been for me and that's what it is for everyone i've watched yep that's for sure and in your book how to start a business on your kitchen table we uh, we made this available for a dollar 99 the ebook so all of you thinking of starting it can go download it. It also you can get the book, um, but um, it's uh, it's available for everybody to get started on their business. How long has Chuckling Goat been going now in business? Uh, we became a limited company in 2014. Yep. So six years. Yep. So, so Sean takes her six years, puts it all in the book, and as she says. Um, you know, she was a, a reporter before in a huge station in Sacramento, right? Like you were, uh, 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 um, like you did interviews and you did mm -hmm. things like that for people. And she loves to research and that's how she got started in the business. She shares some of her tips in there of how she did it each step of the way. A lot of it had to do with coming back to yourself and and meditating it seems like meditation has been a key to your success as well it absolutely has because the world is noisy and the world has a lot of plans for you there's you know 2400 bids on your attention every day so what i tell people is you have to create an extra hour for yourself every single day so that you can be in touch with that little quiet voice inside yourself because that's where you're going to take direction from so one of the things i suggest is make a morning ritual for yourself that is delicious that's yummy you know it's hard to get up early i know i hate to get up early however <laughs> if you have something beautiful to drink and you have maybe an essential oil burner with a lovely fragrance i like rosemary essential oil and you have some beautiful music and you have a journal that you really love then you have all those things that in that excite your senses and it's yummy and so you go to bed an hour earlier because most people are spending an hour more than they need to watching television or on their phones and it's not productive time but they're staying up a little bit too late so if you can go to bed one hour earlier and then get up one hour earlier and have a beautiful uh, morning ritual for yourself, then you can journal, you can write, you can think, you can meditate, and you use that hour to get yourself in the zone. And by the time I, we have 22 people on staff now, so at eight o'clock in the morning, I walk into a full team meeting and I got to face all those people looking at me and they are waiting for me to tell them what to do. If I haven't had my own time with my own meditation, listening to that internal voice, I don't know what to tell them. You know, where, where do I get my instruction from as someone who runs the business from right here in my heart? And, it, and that's what I recommend for everybody. If anything goes wrong, if you need advice, you just get quiet, put your hands on your heart, drop your attention down and do a quick little meditation that I talk you through in the book. And you'll listen for that little voice of guidance and that voice will take you to where you need to be. That's right. So if you want a little advice on how to get started or how to maybe make your business more successful, I highly recommend Sean's book. Thank you so much, Sean. It was a pleasure, Reed. Thank you so much.